This afternoon's exposition is of the fifth psalm with its 12 verses. I've entitled the passage, The King, Righteous and Gracious. The King, Righteous and Gracious. Your prayers put your theology on display. Whether good or bad theology, it comes out when we hear you pray. And any, hear anyone pray. Because your view of God necessarily molds the way you speak to him. If you think of him one way, there is a consistent way to address him. If you think of him in a different way, then you would address him differently. Knowing God matters for many reasons, but one of the more important ones is that we might be able to pray according to the reality of God himself. God, the God of the Bible is not a wax nose that you can mold to your liking. He is what he is. He's eternal, unchanging. And, of course... God revealed himself as he really is to the prophets and to those who wrote the Psalms like David. <clears throat> and their prayers are based on a, an accurate understanding of God as he really is. So would you like to pray like the psalmists prayed? You should want to pray this way. The Psalms are exemplary prayers based on a true view of God. And you will pray this way as you embrace the psalmist's theology. A term came to mind I haven't thought of in a while, and it is the phrase reverse engineering. Reverse engineering, according to the definition, is the reproduction of another manufacturer's product following the detailed examination of its construction or composition. That's what the dictionary says. It would be like some other company besides Apple getting a hold of an iPhone and meticulously noting its, its existence, how big it is, what it looks like, what it's made of, and then perhaps taking it apart and examining all the parts and figuring out what it is, and then after this detailed examination, being able to construct iPhones just like Apple makes. That's reverse engineering. Well, we should uh, come to the Psalms with an intention of reverse engineering. That is, take a close look at a Psalm like this, and observe what it says and think about what it really means by what it says. Come to appreciate the God to whom it is ad addressed and then pray in our own words uh, suitably to this true and living God and after the pattern of a prayer like this. Our prayers should be the result of biblical reverse engineering, so to speak. We should notice the theology of a psalm like this, theology which is at times explicit and other times implicit, and then pray like the psalmist did. And, and I'm familiar with popular views of God, and I've heard lots of modern people pray, especially Christians. And I think from my observation and my study of the fifth psalm that the God of Psalm 5 is at least underappreciated today. That there are aspects of his being and character that, that uh, many Christians don't like or wouldn't even agree with. But to the degree that our theology is wrong, we dishonor God and we pray amiss. There are assumptions and assertions about God implicit in the psalm. First of all, the one who wrote this psalm saw God as the king of kings. God is addressed in this prayer as absolutely sovereign and as the one with universal authority. 
And, and many people today oppose that from the get-go. They don't see God as, as being absolutely sovereign. Atheists, of course, would fall in that category. They say they don't believe in any God at all. Then there are relativists, you know, who would think, well, I worship God the way that I feel I want to worship him, and you can worship God the way you think would, he should be worshipped. And then, then there are people, even within the evangelical church, I would call free willers, free willers who worship a God that is trumped by man's sovereignty. I don't recognize that God from the Bible. The God of this psalm is the king of kings. He's also the king who is righteous. This is also underappreciated about the true God. This God of Psalm 5 is absolutely holy, hating evil, loving good. He is the last court of appeal, and he is a God who is committed to punishing the wicked. Many people, of course, prefer a God without a moral spine who tolerates everyone and everything, basically. That's a false God. The, the God of Psalm 5, thirdly, is the king gracious. He is the only hope of his sinful people. Not their own goodness, but his disposition to keep his gracious promises he freely makes to us. This, this God, who is a king of grace, is also relatively unpopular because many, it seems, believe in a God who grades on a curve and repays those as a reward for doing pretty good in their lives who are more good than evil, who have more good works than sins. That's a very popular false god uh, today. So these things I've spoken are presuppositions of Psalm 5. The sovereignty of God, the righteousness of God, and the grace of God. This psalm confesses God's true character in the prayer and then appeals to God for action consistent with who he is, for God's own action. Concerning the uh, structure of the psalm, the scholars are not all agreed about how it should be broken into parts, but I like what the Kyle and Dalich Old Testament commentary said, that here we have in the Hebrew uh, four six-line strophes or stanzas. Four six-line strophes. And they give a translation and an arrangement of the text where it's obvious. Uh, there are 24 lines and uh, the first six form a, a stanza and then there's a space and the next six and so forth. So I have chosen to divide the message that way. And what that means for us is, and this is easy to see in your Bible, there are 12 verses and th these Six lines make up three verses apiece. So the first point goes with the first three verses, second with the next three, third with the next three, and the fourth with the final three. Um, stepping back from the psalm and considering it in its big picture significance, I would say that uh, what we have here in, in summary is a godly person being maliciously slandered who prays for deliverance. That's evidently about as much as we know about the circumstances of the original composition. A godly person was aware that he was being maliciously slandered and uh, he prayed to God for deliverance from, from the danger of the slander, the malicious, violent purpose of his enemies. So here's, here's a simple outline of the four stanzas of Psalm 5. The first three verses I'm calling Gaining God's Ear. The next three, Confessing God's Hate. The next three, which is verses 7 to 9, Praising God's Love. And the final three, Anticipating God's Judgment. My intention in the message as I preach it this afternoon is just to read the psalm in sections 
and then comment on each section one at a time. So this is God's word in verses 1 to 3, gaining God's ear. This is the appropriate beginning of prayer that starts Psalm 5. Listen to God's word. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. Amen. Now as a as a student of God's word, I believe that I see here five different aspects about prayer in this uh, opening statement, which is intended to gain God's ear. We have the object of prayer, the urgency of prayer, its manner, the devotion involved in this prayer, and the timing of it. First of all, the object of prayer is the Lord, mentioned in verse 1. Of course, that is Yahweh, as you can tell by all capital letters in your English Bible. This is God's unique name. This is the one that is associated with his, his statement about himself, I am. It, it has a rich significance. One of, one of the aspects is that this is the covenant-keeping God of Israel. This God is addressed, secondly, as my king. In verse 2, my king. And to speak this way is for the psalmist to do obeisance or reverence before him in his royal authority. It also implies when the psalmist says, Lord, you are my king, that, that I am your subject. And it was clearly understood in the ancient world that a king has responsibility to take care of his subjects, to defend them from enemies and to provide for them. So, in effect, the psalmist is saying, Lord, I look to you ultimately to take care of me, to defend me against enemies. Thirdly, the divine uh, hearer of this prayer is called my God. And it's the word Elohim in the original. Of course, it has reference to the supernatural um, supreme being, the all-powerful one. Uh, the, the name Elohim has the connotation of strength. And so he is called upon here as the universal supreme ruler of all creation and all human beings. This is the object of prayer, the one to whom the psalmist prays. You'll never find any prayers in the Bible that are holy prayers directed to anyone except for God. Not the Virgin Mary, not St. Joseph, not St. Jude, not any merely human creatures. Always, always, always prayer is directed to God because prayer is in itself an act of worship. When, when the godless pray to Baal or some other false god, it's a horrible sin and it only shows their their wickedness that they should do that we note secondly after the object of prayer the urgency of prayer that comes out in the imperatives uh, here give ear the psalmist says it's if we if that were a statement from a superior to an inferior it would be a command give ear but it but men never command god when when imperatives are directed to god it's rather an urgent plea, an appeal to the Lord. Give ear to my words. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry. And all of these are vigorous verbs. And the, the triplicate is, is a way that in the Hebrew language, extreme emphasis is lent to that which is repeated twice this way. The urgency of prayer. There's a, definitely a strong implication of urgency. Thirdly, there we notice in these first three verses the manner of prayer. The psalmist prays by words, meditation, and the voice of his cry. Give ear to my words. His prayer had verbal content. 
Um, consider my meditation. This is an interesting word in the original. Different translations handle it differently. King James meditation. Other translations put my groaning. Another one says my sighing. In fact, several of them use the word sighing. It can mean a, basically a whisper. It's, I think the literal phenomena is when someone is praying but barely mouthing the words so that if you were going to hear them praying and understand what they were saying, you'd have to be very close and listen because it's barely audible. Consider my whispered prayer. And then the voice of my cry is in verse 2. Hearken unto the voice of my cry. This is not quiet. This refers to loud, audible prayer. Something like prayers that are offered in church so that the whole congregation can hear. That's the manner of prayer. It has verbal content. It's sometimes whispered. Sometimes it's loud. Then the devotion of prayer. Verse 2. Having made this threefold appeal to be heard, the psalmist offers, uh, if you will, an argument for being heard when he says, for unto thee will I pray. Or more simply, for I pray to you. I pray to you. Listen to me, God, because I pray to you. And the strong inference is, only you. I pray to you alone. And in, in other words, I am not a worshiper of false gods. I am devoted to, to you, Lord, to you uniquely, exclusively. You're my God and my hope, my deliverer. No one else is. You know, a worshiper of other gods cannot expect the Lord to hear his prayers. It says in Psalm 66, 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It doesn't mean God's not aware of the prayers, but he will not hear that one favorably. He's not committed to give such a person the answer to their prayer. That's the devotion of this prayer. And then the timing of it in verse 3. Now the timing without... It's hard to miss this. The timing of it clearly is in the morning. In fact, morning is repeated once in verse 3 for emphasis. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. Um, scholars and commentators have their opinion about what the significance is of the word morning being repeated here. There, I read one that said this means it is um, his habit that each morning, as each morning comes, he is found in prayer to the Lord. Another disagreed with that and said rather the emphasis here is just that uh, he begins the day with God. He's not talking about a succession of days, just a particular day. And I start the day with God. Lord, as soon as I'm conscious in the morning, I think of you, I depend on you, I make my prayer to you. So, this is a brief exposition of those three verses. I think I've covered, covered the ground uh, pretty extensively. But what about this? How do we apply this ourselves? Well, clearly, we can glean from this that we glorify God by addressing him reverently as the psalmist did. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he gave us a model prayer and a prayer that we can pray in those precise words. It's known as the Lord's Prayer. And how does the Lord's Prayer start? Not just God, give me this, give me that, give me the next thing. No, it is our Father who art in heaven. We glorify God in addressing him reverently. And this is an excellent example of a, of a faithful, spiritual beginning of prayer. Do you, do you make it a custom when you start to pray, especially in your private prayers, 
to spend time glorifying God at the, at the beginning of your prayer, even before you make any request of God, you should. Secondly, um, it might seem odd for us who, who know that God is omniscient that we should, we should plead for his ear, as this psalm does. Listen to me, God, the psalmist prays. Listen to me. Um, and in fact, it's, it's as if God is a man and he has ears that might not be perhaps inclined in our direction. So the psalmist says, give ear, which is the idea of turning the head so that you can, you can actually hear and discern what it is I'm saying. Now, of course, this is figurative language with respect to God. God is omniscient. God has no ears, literally, physically. This is called an anthropomorphism. I hope you know that. God is without body, parts, or passions. Uh, he is absolute and infinite and eternal, invisible, unchanging, and so forth. But nevertheless, it is accommodated language to express the psalmist's humility in praying to God. He is honoring God's prerogative to hear him or and favor his cause or not. That's why he makes the appeal. It's not because he doubts the omniscience of God. We learn as well for our prayers that uh, true prayer has verbal content, and it may be mental, that is silent, or whispered, or loud. Um, we think, for example, of um, Hannah in the temple when she was so distraught over her barrenness, and she was praying for a son, and uh, she was evidently down on her knees, I think, offering up earnest prayer, and her lips moved, but no sound could be heard. And Eli saw her and thought she was drunk. But she was just deep in prayer, not making a sound. And it was a prayer that the Lord delighted in and was pleased to grant. That was a completely legitimate way to pray. And then concerning this testimony that Lord, you will hear my prayer in the morning. We should take that to heart. How can a believer begin the day without prayer? You know, it says in Proverbs 27, 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You have no, when you wake up in the morning, if you have that kind of a schedule, a normal schedule where you sleep at night and are awake during the day, when you wake up in the morning, you really have no idea what providence has planned for you today. And uh, if you are wise, you will appreciate that except God should help you through the day, you'll never make it. And so with a conscious dependence on the Lord, from your first waking moment in the morning, you're making your petitions to God. Help me, O Lord. Surely we can glean that from Psalm 5. Gaining God's ear. In the first three verses. Next three verses. The most probably surprising part of the psalm. Because here the psalmist confesses God's hate. Confesses God's hate. And it's a pity that this sounds so shocking. I really don't think it should be. If we know God as he really is, this is what we know about God. Look at the text starting with verse 4. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity, Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing, that is lying or falsehood. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. That's um, an English way of saying things to make those adjectives modifying man. But in the original, 
it's closer to this phrase, the Lord will abhor the man of bloods and deceits. But that's, that's a Hebraism. Uh, the margin tells us this for the translation. Well, uh, there are basically six, six lines here. And the first three lines tell us about what God is not. And the next three gods tell us about what God is. God, that is the true and living God, is not one who delights in wickedness. He is not one who welcomes and tolerates evil. He is not a God who approves of foolish or boastful men. The Hebrew might be alternatively translated. This word in the King James rendered foolish is apparently um, full of, of possibilities. Uh, the scholars have grappled with how to put it into English. Some have said, uh, wanton men, they shall not stand in your sight. Wanton means somebody who, in this context, who just engages in deliberate violence without regard to the consequences. Um, merciless, is one of the translations given, inhumane or, or wild men. One of my scholars I consulted translates, wild man shall not stand in thy sight. It's not good, whatever it is. Uh, now, um, the God then the psalmist was praying to, he, the psalmist knew that he was not an evil deity. He was not a corrupt God. Uh, in, such an idea may seem far-fetched to you, but the gods of the nations were like this and, and liked all kinds of wicked behavior. Uh, I mean the idols that the Gentiles worshipped through the ages were not holy like Jehovah. Uh, and the reason is that sinful men have this propensity to create gods after their own image. See, in the, in the biblical uh, truth, we are creatures God created after his image. But in idolatry, men conceive of gods according to their fancy. And their fancy is corrupted by their sinful hearts and their darkened minds. So the gods they invent are gods who basically approve of their sins. You know, have you ever heard the expression hush puppy religion? I guess I'm getting to be a geezer because I know what hush puppies are. Uh, but I don't think, I don't know if they're even sold anymore. Hush puppy was a brand of a shoe in the old days that you could buy new from the store and supposedly, as soon as you put them on, they were comfortable. They didn't require breaking in period. They didn't chafe on your feet or anything like that. Well, you know, what we like as sinners is hush puppy religion. We tend to believe things are true according to how they make us feel and how they accommodate us in our sins. Well, that's not the perspective of the psalmist. Now, if you take um, a study of idolatry in human history, you can see that Old Testament pagan gods, like those worshipped in the land of Canaan, uh, were gods that were celebrated by drunkenness and orgies and infanticide. Yes, that's how depraved that false Canaanite religion was. There was a god named Molech that was a, an idol made of, of, of a metal that was heated to, to, to practically white hot uh, temperature. And then it was part of the worship of Molech to take one's little babes, newly born, and put them inside the idol and let them burn alive. That was part of Canaanite religion. It was horrendous beyond imagination advance this the human story a thousand or two thousand years you come to the roman empire and uh, 
the, the names of the gods worshipped and the rituals had varied somewhat, but it was still the same old corrupt deities that let men and even encouraged men to do things they felt like doing anyway. St. Augustine in his masterful tome, The City of God, complained about the gods of his fellow Roman citizens in these words, the scenic games, exhibitions of shameless folly and license were established at Rome, not by men's vicious cravings, but by the appointment of your gods. And by the way, if you're into old literature, like, I mean, 1,600-year-old literature, you should read some of the City of God. I learned a lot by reading out of that long book. And I just had very little idea and appreciation for what life in pagan Rome was like until I read that book. And, and you know what? Advance human history another 2,000 years, and really fundamentally nothing's changed. It is the same way with popular idols today. One of the manifestations of pop religion is in celebrity culture, for example. And just look at what the celebrities do and how they lived and how they are adored by their fans and then people who who pay homage to them by buying their their product uh, feel good about living in the same way they imagine their pop icons to live. And really, it's the same way with the false antinomian gospel in the church. There, there are so-called Christians that, that truly believe that the grace of God means you can go to heaven despite living like you're going to hell. You know uh, how that comes about, and some of the arguments for it are quite sophisticated. But uh, I, like, I like the brief title of one of the books we used to have on the book table by uh, a certain Reformed author. Uh, I can't recall his name off the top of my head, but the title was No Holiness, No Heaven. And you know... Um, this is the biblical teaching, Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse 14, I think it is. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. See, the true and living God is not a God who approves of evil doing and evil doers. That's what he is not. Now, concerning what he is, we pick up the psalm from the middle of verse 5, where we read, Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak lying. The Lord abhors the bloody and deceitful man. The Tanakh uh, renders it, You detest all evildoers. You doom those who speak lies. Murderous, deceitful men, the Lord abhors. Now, we have to be careful when we interpret passages like this because, believe me, it is not easy to get it just right. To interpret a passage like this that is faithful to the whole counsel of God in Scripture about God and His, his nature, His attributes. We have to remember in interpreting a passage like this, uh, the, the presence of figurative language and analogical considerations and anthropopathisms, which I think touch on how we understand this here. But with all those qualifications, the things you just heard out of Psalm 5 are true about the Lord nonetheless. The Lord abhors the bloody and deceitful man. Abhors. That's a very strong English word that means to hate intensely, to loathe. I think the uh, etymology of the English word abhors uh, comes out of an original that means to shudder. And, and if, that's, if I'm not mistaken about that, this is, conveys the idea, this is not just ordinary hate. This is hate that is so overwhelming that you shake when you think about the object of your hatred. 
with all the qualifications I mentioned, that this is figurative, analogical, and anthropopathic language, it's true about God. There was a church father in the third century named Lactantius. What mother would have chosen that for the name of her baby? Lactantius. Anyway, he wrote on the anger of God. There's a treatise in the uh, Anti-Nicene Church Fathers set, volume 7, called A Treatise on the Anger of God. And in it, in, in effect, Lactantius said pithily, he who does not get angry does not care. He who does not get angry does not care. Moderns typically do not have a, a place in their thinking about God for, for the wrath of God. I found these comments further from Lactantius helpful. Listen to this. If God is not angry with the impious and the unrighteous, it is clear that he does not love the pious and the righteous. He who loves the good also hates the wicked. And he who does not hate the wicked does not love the good. Because the loving of the good arises from the hatred of the wicked and the hating of the wicked has its rise from the love of the good. There is no one who loves life without a hatred of death, nor who is desirous of light, but he who avoids darkness. These things are so connected by nature that one cannot exist without the other. End quote. The true and living God is a righteous God who delights in what is good. And that necessarily implies that he disapproves intensely and hates that which is evil. Amen. Do you worship a God who hates the evil? I hope so, because that's the only God that really exists as he reveals himself in this psalm. So I just want to make a few points of application before we pass on from this part. First of all, God hates excellently. God hates excellently. Here's what I mean. God's hatred is completely praiseworthy. He only hates evil. He hates evil to an infinite degree. And he is evil's perfectly trustworthy opponent. His hatred is a revelation to us of his essential holiness, righteousness, and justice. And, and the godly actually take great comfort in the fact that God hates excellently. Because we see the evil that is prevalent throughout the world. And particularly the evil that the church suffers. Do you know what I read in the news yesterday? And I don't know for sure if this is true, but there's a story about what happened this week in China. The communist government there is reported to be cracking down on Christians. And it, according to the article, it's determined to make them good citizens with their ultimate loyalty to the Chinese government. And so one of the ways they're going about trying to crush the, uh, the Christian um, independent loyalty is to, to uh, demolish church buildings. They, what they're doing is uh, rezoning neighborhoods where a church building has been instructed, constructed so that no church building can exist there legally after the rezoning. And then they send uh, bulldozers to knock down the uh, church building. Well, one of those church buildings was knocked down reportedly this past week. And there were two of the people who were Christians and part of the church there. I don't know if it was the pastor and his wife, but it was two of the people associated with the church, a, a man and a woman. And they stood in front of the bulldozer, something like the protesters at Tiananmen Square in front of the tank, stood in front of the bulldozer to keep the Chinese government from knocking down his church building. And they, the man and his wife both fell into a ditch 
and the bulldozer went after them. The man managed to scramble out of the ditch, but the woman was killed by the bulldozer operator. He ran over her. I hate that, don't you? And God hates that. And that's a comfort to the righteous because injustice has more than met its match in God. This truth that we are considering here is foundational to the Christians leaving revenge to our great and just God instead of taking it into our own hands. We know God hates things like this and will Pay back the wicked. And uh, this is also foundational to our confident hope and expectation of cosmic redemption and eternal life. Things cannot, cannot continue indefinitely as they are because God hates evil. Amen? And we should, we must never doubt God's holy hatred on account of his long-suffering mercy. I had a number of scripture texts to share with you. Um, and maybe, maybe we could look at one or two of them here. Look at Ecclesiastes 8.11, but I feel the stewardship of time. Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Look, you can, in this life, as a rule, you can shake your fist at God and blaspheme the Holy Spirit and murder Christians and steal and rob and cause all kinds of mayhem, and God does not immediately bring his judgment down upon you in its full force. It seems that the ungodly are getting away with their crimes. But they're not. And we must uh, remember that judgment day is coming. And not succumb to the temptation to, to yield to solicitations to evil because it seems that they they go unpunished only for a while in the long-suffering mercy of God, but not forever. I have more. Uh, one more I'll show you. 37 of Psalms. 37th Psalm, first two verses. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Confessing God's hate. Do you do that? Do you confess God's hate as a revelation of his righteousness, holiness, and justice? You you will if you pray like the psalmist. Thirdly, The third stanza of six lines, three verses, I'm calling Praising God's Love. Praising God's Love, verses 7, 8, and 9. This verse, or stanza, starts with a strong adversative, an emphatic contrast when it says, But as for me, as for me. So Hebrew scholars have told me in their books that this is even stronger in the original language as a contrast. Lord, you you loathe the, the wicked, but as for me, things are different. Things are different. And they're different because of your mercy and your love for me. Look, let me just read the verses first of all. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. And in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. 
Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. I call your attention to the expression in verse 7, in the multitude of thy mercy, that is the Lord's mercy. Another translation puts it this way, through your abundant love. And the, the placement of the phrase is in the sentence where the psalmist says, I will come into your house, a reference probably in those days to the tabernacle, later to the temple. Now we understand it, of course, as coming to God uh, himself through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you could even make an application to gathering in the local church and finally all the Christians drawing together to worship in the new creation. I will come into your house through your abundant love. God's abundant love then is the psalmist's understanding of what makes the difference between him and the ones the Lord hates. It's not because he is inherently better than they are. It's because God, in the exercise of his sovereign pleasure, hates one sinner and sets his love on another sinner. And we love him because he first loved us. By the grace of God, the believer is what the believer is. He confesses that by the love of God toward him, he is a sincere worshiper. The sincerity comes out in verse 7 where he says, In thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. And that's a good thing. The fear of God in this sense is a good thing. It is a mark of true piety, of genuine regard for the true and living God, of love toward him, trust toward him. It's, it's worship. In the heart, the fear of God is, is the disposition of the true worshiper. In thy fear, I will worship toward thy holy temple. And this true and sincere worshiper by God's grace is pleading for help to live righteously in front of his ungodly accusers. Verse 8. Lead me, it says, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Or the margin has um, those which observe me. Lord, I need you to lead me in a righteous way because I'm surrounded by these, these lying slanderers who are observing me and who would pounce on any inconsistency in me to speak ill of you, O Lord, uh, from my association with you. That's the sense. He's conscious of his association with God, and the psalmist does not want to bring dishonor to God by sin. So he prays the Lord would give him the wisdom and the strength to, to live a godly life because that way the enemies will not be able to say anything true and bad about the psalmist. And then he describes the psalmist, uh, the enemies rather, in verse 9 when he says there's no faithfulness or steadfastness in their mouth. This is to say they are people of untrustworthy speech, their inward part is very wickedness. In other words, they're rotten to the core. Their, their evil is not superficial. It goes all the way down to the core of their being. Um, their throat is an open sepulcher. That's a very graphic way and poetic way to say that uh, they are out to destroy others by, by character assassination, slandering them behind their backs. And yet, uh, they flatter with their tongue. They flatter. They speak well of the person they hate when they're in front of that person. That's flattery. 
when you, you speak uh, well of a person you inwardly loathe, but when that person's not around, then all the trash talk comes. The person who does this is two-faced. Uh, Psalm 55 verse 21 is relevant here. The psalmist uh, there wrote, The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. That's the worst kind of enemy, I think. The one who is like Judas Iscariot, who, who kisses and then kills the person he kisses. This is life in the real world for a godly person. Now, there's a lot for us to glean from this for personal application as well. Uh, for one thing, and I really would emphasize this from verse 7, the psalmist cannot speak of himself as a true worshiper without praising God's love for making the difference in him. Boast of God's distinguishing love or you will fall into sinful boasting about yourself. Uh, we also learn from this that unbelievers are, uh, are those who sometimes show discernment when criticizing Christians. Um, I, I remember co-workers when I was an electrical engineer who did all kinds of depraved and immoral things, but they knew that I was a Christian. And when I did something that was what you could say a gray area issue, they exhibited all concern and criticism, it seems, that I should be consistent with my Christian testimony. I'll tell you what it was. I had a Halloween mask I brought to work. And they said, you're a Christian. I wouldn't think you would have anything to do with Halloween and Halloween masks and things. And I, I was a fairly new Christian at that point. But I... And, and, not to digress too much here, but I had, these weren't cheap Halloween masks you get at Walmart. My father owned a costume shop, and these were like Hollywood movie quality latex masks that were expensive. And I, I was so idealistic then and, and determined not to give them any ground to criticize me because I represent the Lord. I said, all right, you think these Halloween masks are, are questionable? Here you go. And I took scissors, as I recall, and cut them up and threw them in the trash. I think they were like 80 bucks a piece, two of them. All of a sudden, when they were judging me, they're very, very keen to notice things that they think are inconsistent. But these are the same guys that, that, that did things routinely that they're not even mentionable in church. We need to be sensitive that the eyes of the ungodly are upon us and we should take away from them any legitimate criticism for the sake of the Lord's praise. And in order to do this, we have to rely on God to help us or we will give his enemies an excuse to blaspheme him. We also learn from this part of the psalm that we must remain morally vigilant even when unbelievers speak kindly to us you know they can seem friendly and kind and all that but if they're not christians they're basically hateful people particularly toward god and christians titus 3 3 characterizes the unconverted as hateful and hating one another so i'm not saying that based on some personal knowledge i'm saying it as a matter of scriptural revelation. And then, then I wanted to stress this. Don't view anyone as unredeemable in your life. As the love and grace and mercy of God changed you and set you in a different direction, you who were no different from those who are still in their sins, as we learned from Ephesians 2 this morning, so the gracious love of Almighty God is able to save others as well. Let me, let me recommend you think of non-Christians this way. 
As they are now, so were you, and as you are now, so they may become. Love everyone without exception. One of the reasons you should do that is some of the unconverted are elect sinners and will yet be saved. All right, let me wrap it up with the third, uh, fourth, uh, rather, fourth stanza of the psalm, verses 10 to 12, where the psalmist is anticipating God's judgment. And in this conclusion of the psalm, he, he is looking past the vicissitudes of this present moral turmoil, and he desires out loud the great day of God's judgment to come when everything will be set right. When that great day comes, this will bring condemnation and expulsion of the wicked from the society of the righteous, as well as the justification and welcome of all the righteous into their highest service of unhindered worship. Look with me at the last three verses, starting with verse 10. Destroy them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee, for thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. Amen. Well, verse 10 has to do with the reprobate, those who are destined for hell, I believe. And the prayer given here is to destroy them in the King James. The Hebrew might be translated also make them guilty or condemn them. That's the choice of the Tanakh. Condemn them, O God. That is, those who are bloody and deceitful men and lying men described earlier in the psalm. Condemn them. And uh, the second line of verse 10 has in view uh, the exercise of pure justice in this matter because the ones who are to be destroyed are those who are hoist with their own petard, so to speak. Let them fall by their own counsels. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions. In other words, let them be the greatest victims of their own crimes. That's what justice requires. Cast them out is the manifestation of God's holy rejection of these who are are out of place in God's kingdom. And this is wholly justified because they rebelled against thee, that is, against God. The Tanakh says they defy thee. And so therefore cast them out. I mean, that's what it says. That's the prayer in this part of the psalm. With respect to the others... That is, not these who are bloody and deceitful men. There is a prayer in verse 11. They are first of all described as those who put their trust or take refuge in God. They are the ones who are defended or it could be rendered sheltered by God. And they love his name, which is the same thing as saying they love him. They are the ones who are righteous or perhaps it could be rendered justified in thy sight. Thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous, the justified. And their blessed end prayed for here is that they would rejoice, they would shout for joy or be jubilant, they would be joyful in God or exult in God, as it has been translated. And then we come to the last verse, which obviously is the conclusion of the psalm, verse 12 which emphasizes the triumph of salvation over judgment. The psalm ends on a very positive note. Thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous with favor. Wilt thou compass him as with a shield? Another translation puts it this way. For you bless the godly, O Lord. You surround him with your shield of love. Obviously, 
figurative language. Though God appoints his beloved ones to suffer persecution in this present age, that's only temporary. The cross now leads to the crown later. Our pilgrimage, difficult as it is, has an end in glory. Now, what do we make of these verses for ourselves? Well, we see from them, first of all, that it is a holy and righteous thing to desire the end that God has planned from eternity. You know, when it, I, I think that modern Christians tend to wince when they read the verse of a holy inspired man here like this, destroy them, O God. But isn't that what God is going to do with all the finally impenitent? Destroy them, condemn them, count them guilty, punish them for their sins? If that's what God has planned to do, and we know from Scripture it is, it's not wrong to desire God to carry out his plan. This petition has New Testament equivalents in sayings like this. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And even so come, Lord Jesus. Think about the significance of that statement from John the Apostle. The book of Revelation is proverbial for its horrific judgments. Almost from the beginning of the book to the end, there are, there are people being slaughtered and people being burned alive and people falling into a bottomless pit and cast into a lake of fire, all of this finally coming to fruition when Jesus Christ comes back to this world. That's when the judgment in its full force and fury falls upon those who are still rebels against God. And, and, and it's all connected with the second coming of Jesus. Listen, you don't need the book of Revelation to know this. What about 2 Thessalonians chapter 1? 2 Thessalonians 1 says that, that, that the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking revenge on them that know not God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's going to happen when Jesus comes back for all the reprobate. And what does John the apostle say to it? Even so come, Lord Jesus. Even so come. This is what is called an imprecatory or curse prayer. And such holy prayers in the Bible are never from personal malice, but from zeal for God's glory and the good of the church. But you see, brethren, the overthrow of Satan's kingdom is a large part of how God glorifies himself and rescues the church. If you want to see God glorified, if you want to see all God's elect saved, that is bound up in God taking judicial, hostile action against the, the evil powers. That's the biblical picture of things. It's not wrong to pray this way. We also glean that each believer's individual suffering is a tiny microcosm of the sufferings of the church militant, and our prayers for a personal deliverance should extend to all our suffering brethren. We can pray even today for those dear Christians in China, even the specific ones that are grieving today over what happened. And let us never forget, in closing, that Christ himself sang psalms like this one. And his resurrection and exaltation is a major step forward in redemptive history to the complete answer of these prayer requests in the age to come. Amen. May the Lord help us to appreciate, understand, and even pray and sing Psalm 5.